are are poetry. They're musical poetry. They were used as the as a hymnal, if you will, in the tabernacle and the temple worship, and even in the time of of Jesus, they were they used the Psalms. In fact, Jesus and the disciples knew the Psalms quite well because it was part of their weekly worship and using the Psalms to to teach and to worship. So Psalms 1 and 2 is kind of like an introduction to the Psalms. And in that, you have the first Psalm, you have the ideal righteous person, what it means to live a, a happy life according to God's standards. And the emphasis on Psalms 1 is the, the law. Following the law. If you follow the law, you're going to be happy. And then in Psalms 2, it's kind of a, a kingly royal psalms. And it was used in coronation celebration of the king. Now, as the Davidic king, under uh, David, fell apart, if you know your Israelite history, David was anointed as king and ushered in the what they call the golden era of Israel. Uh, Jerusalem was the temple, or the center. They had the temple there. Um, he established worship and really established Israel as a, a potential power in the region. But we all know the story of David. He messed up. He had an affair with Bathsheba. Because he was a man of war, God says, I'm not going to let you build my temple. That will be, your son will build it. So Solomon, his son, builds the temple. But Solomon quickly, quickly screwed up. And because of Solomon's actions, Israel basically disintegrated as a, a power. So after that disintegration, Psalms 2 became a psalm that anticipated the Messiah. So Psalms 2 is a royal psalm and it anticipates the coming future Messiah. Now, Psalms is a large book composed of 150 hymns, poems, sayings, however you want to say it. So 1 and 2 starts out as kind of an introduction. And then it ends, if you kind of follow the progression, it ends the last five psalms, Psalms 146 through 150, the emphasis is on, on praise. This is why I don't like, like the microphone, but we'll live with it. How many know that life, life isn't a straight line? <laughs> uh, so Psalms is like this. If you look at it as progression, it's up and down, it's flat, it's up and down, up and down, up and down, ends in praise. That's, that's life. We have frustrations. We, we suffer, we have successes, we have doubts, we have regrets, we have all that, and that's why Psalms is, is so popular, because it helps us relate to life. The benefits of Psalms is it's a guide to worship, it helps us worship, it helps lead us into worship, it helps us relate to God honestly. Psalms lets us know that we can complain to God. We can cry out to God. We can express our deepest hurts, our deepest emotions through
through the Psalms and honestly. But it also helps us reflect and meditate on what God has done for us and what God is continuing to do. So Psalms is a really, really good um, benefit to our worship experience. So Psalms, roughly, it's hard to put an outline on Psalms, but roughly the first half is lament. Woe is me, God, why is this happening? Um, I'm crying out to you, those kinds of things. And the last half focuses on praise with the climax in the last five. So it kind of a progression of that. And so we have the anointed king and one of, the main, one of the main themes in Psalms, and there's a lot, and we'll see that a little, bit, a little bit later. There's a lot of themes that are introduced. And they're introduced in such a way that it's like poetry. So it's like, I wish the biblical authors would give us a lot more details than they do. Sometimes they just hit a subject, and you went, wow, what? And he goes on to something else. And that's real, real popular in the Psalms. So a lot of times, like I said, even everyone in Jesus' time knew the Psalms because it was their ritual. They sang it over and over. How many know the tune to Jesus or the words to Jesus loves me? Yeah, just about everybody. Why? Because during our formative year, Sunday school, whatever, every week, every week you heard it, you heard it. That was the same thing with the Psalms. They heard it every week, every week. They heard the Psalms. Jesus and the disciples knew the Psalms. Even though they knew the Psalms, the people in their generation knew the Psalms, <coughs> they didn't know the Psalms get to that in a minute. One of the things, so we have this Messiah, the King, the hope of Israel. Paul uses that phrase in his last recorded speech in Acts 28, 20. And he's before the Jewish leaders. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. The hope of Israel was a catchphrase for the coming Messiah. So what Paul's saying is, I'm in chains because I have the same hope that you have. That the Messiah is coming. Although for Paul, he knew the Messiah had already come in Jesus Christ. One of the things that the Psalms does, it prepares us for a, a suffering a suffering servant, a suffering Messiah. Something that did not fit the, with the Jewish leaders, the Israelite soul, if you will. Their idea of a Messiah was a conquering hero that would deliver them from all foreign oppression, specifically Roman oppression. So when Jesus came, basically out of nowhere, from a, a small family, and he began to preach the idea of, yes, I am the Messiah, I am the one that's going to redeem Israel, but Along the way, I'm going to have to be crucified. That didn't set well with them. And then when he said, I'm going to resurrect from the dead, and I'm going to forgive sins, suddenly this concept of a conquering hero as a man suddenly doesn't make sense because now this guy is talking about being the Messiah 
but also God having power to forgive sins. They could not handle Jesus as a suffering servant. Let's look at Psalms 22. Do I have any volunteers who would like to read? Okay, if you'd like to read, read Psalms 22, 1 through 8. And I want, as we're listening to this, imagine that you don't know anything about the Old Testament. You don't know anything about Jesus. And I know that's hard to do, hard to suspend what we already know. But for the moment, pretend that you do not know anything about the Old Testament, nor do you know anything about, about Jesus. So who, who wants to read? Anybody? Okay. One through eight. One through eight. Try to read it with emotion, if, if possible. Because Psalms, go, it's poetry and it appeals to the emotions. Go ahead. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I'm not silent. You are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put forth their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. All right, so he's describing a person. What what is your impression of, of this person? If you're reading this... He's in sorrow and unworthy. What's that? He's in sorrow and unworthy of anything. He's in sorrow? Anything else? Feels forsaken. Forsaken? The other thing is he talks about... Well, God, you saved Israel. They heard you. But I am a worm and no man. What he's saying there is, you rescued them. I'm not even worthy to be rescued. So this image is very sorrowful, very desperate. And these are the exact words that Jesus quoted on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The problem is, that's where we stop. That's usually what, that's usually our, if someone says, can you quote Psalms 22, what Jesus said on the cross, you'd say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So let's continue. Is anybody else going to read? Any volunteers? I'll read. Okay, read. This is a little bit longer section. Nine through 18. Again, try to be with passion, but uh, do the best you can. 9 through uh, 18. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me just at, made me trust, oh, let me start. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. Oh, you I cast from my birth. I was cast from my birth. I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my brother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is no hope. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bull, bulls of basin surround me. They open wide their mouths like a ra ravaging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are cut out joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a post shared, and my tongue sticks to my drawers. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, and my a company of evildoers encircle me. 
They have pierced my hands and feet. I can't count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. That's, oh, a, that's actually good. Just through 18 is good. So again, what's, what's your impression of, of this person, this suffering person? He has no hope. No hope? Desperate. Desperate. You have the images of a wild beast surrounding him. We've all seen images of that in, in movies where a pack of wolves surround uh, someone. Or, or worse yet, um, the National Geographic specials where you see the wolves and lions tearing into a, a carcass, a dead, deformed carcass, and they're just tearing apart. That's the image that the psalmist is trying to convey to this person, or about this person. He's so desperate that the wolves are surrounded, they're tearing at his flesh. They pierce his hands, which, which is interesting. Once, now that we know the psalms points to Jesus, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. They pierced his hands and feet. What's interesting is crucifixion wasn't even invented as a form of death and punishment till much later, till when the Romans took over. I mean, other cultures used it before that, but at the time of Psalms, that type of crucifixion, that type of death, wasn't even known. So it was kind of a prophetic outlook. And so if you stop reading Psalms 22 at verse 18, you would have this image of a desperate, suffering, humiliated, I mean, even in his death, they were continually, and we, we see that in the cross, the continual humiliation. Even while he's dying, they're taunting him and mocking him. And then he's stripped naked. I mean, he's, he's dying. He's exposed. Stripped naked. In the ancient culture, when someone was stripped naked, that was a form of pure humiliation. I mean, it was like, you, you are worthless. You have no clothing. You have no margins. That's exactly what they did at the cross. They divided his lots. They divided his clothes for lots. Again, a prophetic thing. Like I said, the Jewish leaders, they knew the Psalms, but they didn't know the Psalms. If they had known the Psalms and really read the scriptures, they could have seen Psalms 22 and went, wait a minute. God is predicting a suffering servant. And if they were to look back to Isaiah, they would have realized the suffering servant was going to be the anointed one. So if we, we stop at verse 18, we would have no hope. But what's interesting with Psalms 22, even though it talks about the suffering and the sufferings of the Messiah and the sufferings of Christ, If we read it carefully, it becomes real interesting. Anybody else want to finish out um, Psalms 22 from 19 through 31? It's a little bit longer passage. Anybody? All right. I'll go ahead and read it. And surely it started with... Uh, Verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from me, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, 
and from the horns of the wild oxen. He's repeating that image of, of wild uh, animals. And this is what it's interesting, at least in my Bible, and I don't, I almost have it, I don't believe. At the end of 21, there's a little postscript. You have answered me. The first part of Psalms, he's talked about, God, you're so far from me. You rescued Israel, but you don't rescue me. Suddenly this person's saying, you have answered me. Verse 22, this is where it gets real good if you listen carefully. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And he's calling for others to praise him. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the descendants of Jacob's glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor poured the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. When he cried to him, he heard. What do you think is the issue in verse 22? He says, I will declare your praise. I will declare your praise in the assembly. A metaphor for the temple. How does this suffering, totally dead person declare praise? After the resurrection. The resurrection. Next week we celebrate that event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Psalms 22 moves from lament to hints of resurrection to praise. Now he's calling for, for everyone, Israel, all people, to, to praise him. This person was dead, and now he's talking about declaring the praises. And let's continue. Verse 25, again, a, a repeat of 22, which is very typical of Hebrew poetry. They say something, they repeat it. My praise shall be, be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who hear me. Oh, the other thing in verse 24... Part of 22 could be likened to a lament for Israel as a, as a nation. We're worthless. We're constantly being oppressed. Verse, so verse 24 says he's not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Those who are afflicted, those who are poor, those who are lame, those who are hurt, Physically, mentally, God was restoring. Verse 25, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear, fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. This is where it gets interesting because now he's not talking about the resurrection. He's talking about something greater something bigger. The Messiah King was suddenly not just a Israelite king. See, one of the themes of, of the Psalms is God the King rules. God the King rules over creation, over nations. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. Suddenly this suffering servant, now this resurrected, is somehow a king over everything. The sovereign Lord reigns. All the prosperous of, prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. 
So you have three types of people. You have the prosperous, the wealthy. You have all those who go down to dust. In other words, all humanity, because dust to dust we are, we're all going to die. So basically he's saying everyone, and if it doesn't include, if that wasn't enough, even the poor who cannot keep themselves alive. So in a few short sentences, he says that everyone, no matter what your status, no matter what kind of condition you're in, you're going to bow down before the great king. And posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. So now we have the everyone's going to bow down. There's going to be a a message that people are going to tell of it. And just a, a little teaser. Acts 1.8, you should be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. So in Psalms 22, we see that God's people, the suffering servant's people, the righteous king's people, would declare the goodness and the righteousness of this king, of this great king. So Psalms 22, in a very short order, encompasses all the major themes of Psalms. It has lament, for sure. Then it has worship and praise. But it also has the idea of the great king. Written in poetic, poetic form. So the Psalms really, if we really look at the Psalms, they really, um, really can teach us an awful lot. And one final Psalms, a very short Psalms. Any volunteers to read Psalms one ten? Anybody? Okay, Psalms 110. And this is a considered a royal psalm and talk about the, the king. Go ahead. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power in the beauties of a holiness, from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall ex execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook of by drink of the brook by the wayside therefore he shall lift up his therefore he shall lift up the head okay this psalms is an interesting psalms jesus uses this and confounds his um, opposition because in israel everyone had two lords two kings they had an earthly king which in the Israel nation was supposed to represent God and be a representative, but they also understood the idea of order, and so we need to submit to the king even if we don't like him, that he's God's purpose in life. But also for the Israelite, they had another Lord, the Lord in heaven. Everyone had two lords except the king. But yet David says, my Lord sit at my how does this go? The Lord sit at my right hand. I make your enemies my footstool. So David was acknowledging 
in this Psalms that he had another Lord. And we know it to be Jesus. And it, this anointed one becomes a warrior king. They make their enemies their footstool. He talks about the rod of your strength from, from Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. God was taking over territory that was originally his, those who usurped in the garden. So now God is ruling right in the midst of his enemies. Another teaser for Acts. Acts often uses the phrase, and the word of God multiplies. Every time the word of God multiplied, it was in contested territory. The anointed king is ruling in the midst of his enemies. So we have the Messiah as king, Messiah as divine deity, which the people of Jesus' time had a hard time handling. We also have his humanity expressed as well. But then he makes an interesting phrase. God will not relent. He makes a vow. You are a priest forever, according to the Chels deck. Wow, oh, I do not like the leash. Um, Need the uh, yeah, I've got one. I've got one order actually. It's coming in um, so kings came from Judah. Priests came from the tribe of Le Levi through Aaron. Jesus, for the most part, came from the tribe of of Judah. How can he be a priest and king? Because it. You know, it doesn't make sense. Genealogically, he couldn't be a priest. God knew that. God anticipated that. So he creates this character, a Chelsebeck, who comes out of nowhere. Very little is known about him. I mean, you can go back and there is some... Uh, Gary Wooden did a thing on that, on tracing Chelsebeck. So you can't do that. But if we just take a plain reading of the scripture, this character shows up out of nowhere, has a few encounters with Abraham and a few others, and then he disappears. And we don't really hear anything about him until later on in the New Testament, and the New Testament writers make the connection that tells that Christ. God creates a new order of priesthood so that his servant son could be a priest. So God is working everything out um, to perfection. Then he talks about the judgment. There's going to be a judgment we saw in Psalms 22 that everyone will bow down. And now he's talking about um, drastic judgment. He would execute. He would kill. He would fill the place with dead bodies. And it's interesting, the word corpses. I don't know why I'm thinking it. The weird things you think of. Old Testament history, we had to do, or not old, uh, high school history. It was a world history or American history, I'm not sure exactly what, but we had to do a presentation. And this one guy was talking about the Army, the Corps, the Army Corps. And he used the word corpses instead of Corps. The teacher just cracked up. I mean, it's just like, what are you talking about? It's, you know, it's not dead bodies. So. I don't know why I think that. That was just a weird <laughs> sudden thing, y'all. 
So he's, he's got this judgment, this wrathful judgment. But verse 7 is kind of interesting. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up his head. It's actually a kind of a different way of saying you rule in your enemies. What he's saying is that this warrior king will, will rule in such a way that he'll be able to drink of the cool, clear brook water in enemy territory. To drink from the water in enemy territory it was to say that one, you are superior, and two, you are certainly not intimidated. Once again, God goes into contested territory. God, as the ruling king, moves into contested territory. We saw in Psalms 22, the suffering servant. We celebrate that next week, Good Friday. But we also celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes all the difference. It made all the difference to the disciples. It makes all the difference to us. Psalms leads us into worship. But it helps us reflect honestly to God. Because we have a great king. A great king that suffers like we did. But he suffered not just for the sake of suffering. He suffered for the purpose. And then we see in Psalms 110, the majestic, reigning, powerful King of Kings. So as we read through the Psalms, try not to just read it as poetry. It is. But try to read it with God's heart. What does God say? What does he want us to reflect on? What does he want us to think about? Because the Psalms leads us, like all of scripture, to Jesus. It leads us all to, it leads us to worship and to, it says, your servants will volunteer. We willingly want to submit to this great and glorious king. So the Psalms are, are great. Like I said, there's 150 of them, but we can only, um, only do a few. And I want to focus on, on Jesus Christ today because of, because of Easter and Palm Sunday and that kind of stuff. So Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is reigning. And his word will go forth into contested territory. So we do not have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to be afraid of the evil that's behind us, in front of us, around us. God reigns and rules. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the Psalms. We thank you that they lead us to you. Help us always to remember you are the great king and we serve you with glad hearts. We thank you for death, resurrection, and life of Jesus Christ. So it help us always to remember you are the great king and you are in control and we need not be afraid. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.